in this lecture we are going to discuss about basic concepts of growth and development okay this topic will be dealt under following headings introduction definition physiology of the growth factors affecting the growth and development variability of the growth pattern of the growth mechanisms of the growth modes of collecting the growth data and what are the different kinds of studies that we can carry out to study the growth all these things will be dealt in this lecture face is a, you know it's a mobile mask in front of the brain it began to attract the people around us when we were babies and this will continue till our senility or adulthood that's why it is very much important to know how the growth of this fascinating thing happens and what are the factors affecting the development of this uh, component important component of the human body okay that's why we'll know the step by step processes of different concepts of the growth and development okay development is nothing but a process of maturation from a single cell to a more organized tissue thereby a component of tissue and a number of tissues will combine to form a human body so development is nothing but a process of maturation from a single cell with simple function to a more complex tissue or organ with a single or multiple functions okay when we look into the definition of the growth various authors have proposed various definitions for growth some say it is increase in size some say it is increase in size change in proportion and increasing increasing complexity some say that it is self multiplication of living substance yet we have some more definitions for growth and development that you can uh, find out in this powerpoint it's nothing but quantitative aspect of a biological development that is measurable and it is calculated in unit of time okay now what is development development is nothing but its progress towards maturity or we can call it as all the naturally occurring unidirectional phenomena from a tissue as its existence as a single cell to a more complex organ right from beginning of the human life till the death of the individual this is called as development now the next important thing is how do we grow or how does the component parts of the human body grow just we can have a look at an overview of the physiology of growth growth occurs by a continuous interaction between hormones and human tissues okay the hormone that mainly regulates the growth of an individual is growth hormone secreted by pituitary gland when you look into the overview of physiology pituitary gland secretes a growth hormone that is somatotropin this growth hormone has its direct influence on the growth of skeletal and non skeletal tissues as well as its action is mediated by another hormone which is secreted by liver that is somatomedin so the growth hormone by its direct action on the tissues as well as somatomedin somatomedin mediated action on the tissues will lead to growth and development of an individual when we have a individual with low levels of somatomedin we can have a stunted or retarded growth low levels of somatomedin is seen in cases where there are excessive glucocorticoids protein calorie malnutrition or excessive levels of estrogen hormone in the blood stream or by estrogen administration so the basic thing is growth hormones main action is mediated by the somatomedin that is secreted by the liver any condition that has a, a negative impact on the secretion of somatomedin will lead to the retarded growth because 
there is no mediating component uh, to elicit or to you know uh, to elicit a growth response as a result of growth hormone secretion. Okay, so any condition which lead to uh, reduced secretion of somatomedin will lead to retarded growth, whereas the conditions with sufficient levels of somatomedin will lead to a optimized growth in the individual. Now, apart from the growth hormone, skeletal maturation or the growth of the individual is also influenced by some of the hormones like thyroxine, testosterone, estrogen and adrenal cortical hormones. Thyroxine and testosterone has a positive impact on the maturation of an individual that means they have a uh, uh, these hormones favors more development and more rapid maturation whereas the excessive levels of estrogen might lead to uh, retarded growth and development of an individual okay now let us look into the factors that are affecting the growth of an individual heredity nutrition climatic conditions illnesses family size and birth order of the individual socio-economic status all these factors are influencing the growth of an individual so when we take the heredity usually we know that the growth is contributed partly by genetics and partly by the environment that means it's a multifactorial effect so heredity is one of the important factors that affecting the growth and development that's why we can see uh, the features of the offspring will be simulating one of the family members of either the paternal side or maternal side okay now the next thing that is affecting the growth of an individual is nutrition how does the nutrition affect the growth of an individual? As we usually know, if we take a protein rich diet, we can have a, a good body build. Okay. So in this way, the more nutritious the food is or the more nutritious the diet is, more will be the positive effect on the growth of an individual and maturation of the individual. Now when you take the illnesses, Whenever an individual is affected due to a chronic illness, particularly during the peak stages of growth and development, then the illness will have, an, a, a, will have a negative effect on the growth of an individual, as we usually know. Okay. Suppose, if a patient has a protein calorie malnutrition, like Kvashiarkar or marasmus, particularly during the development stages, then the child will land up in a very, uh, you know, abnormal body build or physique. Either the patient will be too lean or too fat depending upon the type of malnutrition. The next important factor that influences is race of an individual. For example, if we take a particular ethnic group or particular group of people staying in a particular geographical area all the people will be having a similar facial features this is ethnicity for example if we take Americans and Africans all the Africans will have a protrusive lips and heavy jaws whereas we can find uh, specific features in Americans and Europeans that means by seeing an individual we can have a rough estimate to of to which region this person belongs to that means the ethnicity has certain influence on growth of an individual the next important factor that affects the growth of an individual is the socio-economic status the rich the individual is good will be his or her diet habits and the person will be getting a healthy food and healthy nutrition thereby the growth of an individual will be good the next important thing is exercise the more we do exercises the more will be the muscle built so the exercises mainly have an effect on the musculature of the individual okay that's why we will be going uh, will be going to some uh, you know workout places or gyms in order to build the muscle so the exercise will lead to hypertrophy or increase in the size of the muscle which will add up to the uh, 
more heavy physic of an individual. The psychological dispenses are one of the factors that influences the growth of an individual. The more the psychological dispenses, the more retarded will be the growth. Similarly, any endocrine disorders that a patient has or the or an individual has. So, uh, as I told you, the growth is mainly a result of interaction between the body tissues as well as the endocrine system. If the endocrine system is out of balance or if the endocrine system is affected due to physiological disturbances, then it will have its effect on the growth of an individual also. In this way, there are a number of factors that affects the growth of an individual. So the ultimate outcome or the ultimate result will be the interaction between genetic makeup of an individual and all these factors. If these factors are positive, then the growth will be good and balanced. If all these factors are negative or disturbed, then the growth of an individual will also be disturbed and it will be deviating from the optimum. Now, let us discuss about the pattern of the growth of an individual. When we take an individual, all the tissues within the individual does not grow at the same rate and to the same extent. The pattern of growth can be discussed under two subheadings. One is cephalocaudal growth gradient and one more thing is Schemann's growth curve. What is a cephalocaudal growth gradient? Cephalo means head whereas caudal means the other end of the body. So the, the tissues which are farther from the head will grow at a faster rate and to a greater extent and up to later ages of the life when we compare the tissues which are closer towards the head. When we see a child or when we see a fetus, head contributes to almost 50% of total body length. As the growth of the individual continues after birth till the person reaches the adulthood, the contribution of head will be reduced to almost only 12% of the total body length. That means the tissues which are away from the head will grow to a greater extent until later ages of the life and at a rapid rate. That is why within the head when we see the maxilla and mandible, the growth of the maxilla is completed much earlier when compared to the growth of the mandible. Okay. This is the cephalocaudal growth gradient. The next important concept is Schemann's growth curve. This is nothing but a graphical representation of growth of different tissues in the body. Here, in the Schemann's growth curve, the body tissues are divided into four types. Neural tissue, general tissues, lymphoid tissues and genital tissues. When we take a neural tissue, by around 6 to 7 years of age, the neural tissue will grow completely and it will reach the size that is actually present in the adult size by around 7 years of age. What I mean to say is, the growth of the neural tissue is completed maximum to about 96 to 97% around 6 to 7 years of age. That means, by 6 to 7 years of age, the individual will be having a neural tissue which actually is present in a adulthood. Okay? When we take a lymphoid tissue, the lymphoid tissue will grow to about 200% in the late childhood. This is a mechanism of defense. That means, in children, they are more prone for infections. In order to combat the infection, the lymphoid tissue will grow to a 200% that means double to the adult size at by around late childhood. From the onset of puberty, the lymphoid tissue starts involuting or regressing. This is called as negative growth. That's why uh, we can see actions of we can't see thymus in the adults, whereas we can see thymus in the childhood. And we can see tonsils in the childhood gradually as the growth of the individual proceeds the tonsils will get regressed this is called as negative growth so uh, growth can't be take, uh, taken uh, taken granted as only a positive growth here we can notice that 
the lymphoid tissues undergo negative growth. That means as the age of the individual advances, the lymphoid tissue gets regressed. Okay. Now, the next thing is genital tissues. Till the puberty, there is no growth in the genital tissues. But at the onset of puberty, there is a rapid increase in the growth of the genital tissues and development of the genital tissues and the maturation of the genital tissues and reaches the adulthood. Thereafter, the growth is stable. Now, the next important thing is somatic tissues or general tissues, the muscles, bones and all. This somatic tissues does not grow at a same pace. There are periods of rapid growth and periods of constancy and again periods of rapid growth. That means there are intervals of rapid growth and stunted growth in the growth of somatic tissues. And the curve on the graph is a sigmoid shaped curve as you can notice in the PowerPoint slide. The next com concept of the growth is variability of the growth. As the heading itself indicates, the growth of an individual is variable. This variability is seen not only between the individuals but also within the individual at different periods of time. Okay, now when you see the variability, there are different uh, different timings of the growth and uh, different optimal parameters of the growth for boys as well as girls. So there are different growth charts to assess the variability of the growth in the individuals. So these growth charts are available separately for boys as well as girls. Based upon this growth chart, we can say whether the growth of an individual at particular point of time is optimum for his age or for her age or not can be assessed based upon these growth charts. Now, the variability might be a normal vari variation or due to the illnesses or diseases that is affecting the individual or optimum timings of growth of an individual. Now, the timing of growth of an individual varies from gender to gender and within the individual there will be accelerated growth at certain point of time and reduced growth at other points of time. So these periods of accelerated growth in an individual are called as growth spurts. There are four growth spurts. Just before birth, one year after birth, prepubertal growth spurt and adolescent growth spurts. Prepubertal growth spurt is around 7 to 9 years in females and 8 to 11 years in males whereas adolescent growth spurts occur around 11 to 13 years in females whereas it occurs around 14 to 16 years in males that means you can clearly notice that accelerated growth periods occurs in the lives of females at an earlier stage when compared to males that's why females mature earlier when compared to males now, what is the importance of these growth spurts? As I told you, females mature earlier when compared to males. The main reason behind this is the existence of a weak androgen called as dehydroepiandrosterone or androstenolone in females at adrenarch. We call it as adrenarch, which occurs in females. This is the main hormone that is responsible for accelerated maturity in females when compared to males. Now, what is the importance of Adolescent growth spurt. See, when a person reaches a stage of adolescence, there will be a secretion of stimulating hormones by pituitary gland which stimulates the gonadal hormones and adrenal hormones which have a positive impact on growth of an individual. That's why at adolescence, mainly due to hormonal changes, there will be accelerated growth of the individuals. In males, testis secretes the hormones testosterone okay the sertoli cells particularly in testis secretes testosterone whereas leydig cells secretes the estrogen similarly in females estrogen is produced initially and then progesterone whereas the adrenal cortex secretes adrenal hormones so these hormones have a impact on 
growth of an individual the surge of the hormones is seen at an adolescence thereby leading to increased growth of the individual at adolescence contributing to the adolescent growth spurt so the sex hormones through the blood stream reaches the tissues and leads to accelerated growth of the body tissues whereas these hormones will have a negative impact on the lymphoid tissue the sex hormones have effect on the cartilage and increases the rate at which the cartilage is transformed into the bone thereby adding up to the increased skeletal maturation and then the growth is completed now what is the clinical significance of growth spurts number one knowing the growth spurts will help us to differentiate between a pathological surge in the growth or a optimum growth spurt that means when an individual is found to have a rapid or accelerated growth we don't know whether it is a pathological or a optimum one by knowing the period of growth spurt or timing of growth spurt we can say yes this is a normal growth normal thing that is happening in every individual one more clinical significance of growth spurt is any growth modification treatment procedures by myofunctional appliances or orthopedic appliances works best during the growth spurts of an individual particularly the adolescent and prepubertal growth spurts so by knowing the timing of the growth spurts we can judiciously plan our treatment and effectively institute the orthopedic or myofunctional appliance therapy during growth stages of an individual and one more thing to note down is growth spurts will help us to assess whether a surgical procedure be carried out or can't be carried out during the particular stage of the individual usually no surgical procedure is carried out during the growth spurts surgical procedures should be carried out only after completion of the growth spurts okay these are the significances of there are certain periods during the growth and development wherein any kind of impact will lead to a greater damage to the tissues that are developing these periods are called as critical periods for example as i told you the neural tissue shows its maximum growth during 6 to 7 years of uh, within 6 to 7 years of age that means any illness or any environmental influence on the neural tissues during these periods will lead to a greater extent of damage or greater uh, hindrance to the development of this particular tissue so this period of 6 to 7 years age is called as critical period with respect to the neural tissue whereas when we compare a general tissue the growth will be extending from 15 to 20 years of age of the individual so any damage to the tissues of the individual during this period will lead to a sorry the a, any influence or any uh, illness or any environmental influence that has a negative impact on the tissues if occurs during this period will lead to a greater damage to the tissues so these are called as critical periods now let us look into the modes of growth when we take any tissue it is composed of several cells so at the cellular level if you take growth growth can occur by hypertrophy that is increase in size of the cell or hyperplasia increase in number of cells or deposition of substance between the cells or interstitial tissues these are modes of growth that happens in any tissue whether it's a skeletal or non skeletal tissues when you take a growth of the skeletal tissue we can see interstitial growth as well as uh, interstitial growth as well as deposition and resorption of the bone now how does a bone or skeletal tissue form 
skeletal tissue can be formed either by intramembranous ossification or endochondral ossification what do you mean by intramembranous ossification it is nothing but first a connected tissue will be formed and thereby gradually the calcification of this connected tissue will happen this is called as intramembranous ossification most of the calvarial bones that is the parietal occipital the frontal bones the maxilla the body of the mandible these things or these structures are formed mainly by intramembranous ossification whereas certain bones are formed by endochondral ossification what is endochondral ossification it's nothing but first a cartilage is formed it is entirely replaced or it's entirely replaced by a skeletal tissue or a bone that means in place of the cartilage bone is formed this is called as endochondral ossification bones of the cranial base is main example for bone that is formed by endochondral ossification okay so these are the two processes of osteogenesis when we take the mechanism of bone growth that means once the bones are formed how does they grow there are different processes of bone growth with respect to size as well as position number one is bone remodeling that means the bone undergoes continuous remodeling by deposition on one surface and resorption on another surface as this remodeling process continues the bone will be moving towards the depository surface this is called as cortical drift so these are the things happening within the growing skeletal tissue at the same time when we take a craniofacial skeleton different components of the bones are attached to their counterparts for example maxilla is attached to the cranium as the maxilla grows by remodeling remodeling process it will also increases in size and gets displaced away from the cranium so this process of displacement of the bone by virtue of its own growth is called as primary displacement apart from this the skeletal structures that are attached to the maxilla also grow and they will provide a thrust to the maxilla thereby displacing it in a downward and forward direction this is called as secondary displacement so the mechanisms of bone growth are one is remodeling the second one is cortical drift and the third one is displacement displacement is again of two types primary displacement secondary displacement primary displacement is displacement of bone by virtue of its own growth whereas secondary displacement is displacement of bone by virtue of growth of the structures surrounding it okay coming to the sites and types of growth of the bone in the craniofacial skeleton we can divide the skull into the following sub parts cranial vault cranial base nasomaxillary complex and mandible when you take the cranial vault the bone formation is mainly by intramembranous ossification by simultaneous resorption and deposition of the bones in the calvaria okay when you take the cranial base we can see a number of primary cartilages of the cranial base in between base, occipital bone sphenoid bone and ethmoidal bone we call it as occipital uh, spino occipital synchondrosis spinoethmoidal synchondrosis and interspinoidal cartilage okay so these are the primary cartilages that are ultimately uh, the, that are ultimately replaced by the bone by endochondral ossification which will lead to formation of a cranial base when you take an nasomaxillary complex it also undergoes a intramembranous ossification and by surface remodeling we can see resorption on the anterior surface of the maxilla and deposition in the tuberosity region and the maxilla will be moving towards the resorptive surface that means according to enlo if you look into the image the cortex will drift towards the depository surface as the growth or as the remodeling occurs whereas the entire bone will be moving away from the drifting cortex that means for example if you take a maxilla resorption will occur on, on the anterior surface of the maxilla and deposition occurs in the tuberosity that means if we take 
the cortex within the maxilla. The cortex is drifting posteriorly, whereas the maxilla as a whole is drifting in an opposite direction, that is anteriorly. Okay. When we take the palate, we can see resorption on the nasal side of the palate, whereas deposition on the oral side of the palate, thereby, thereby the capacity of the uh, nasal cavity will be increased and the palate will become shallow and wide. When you take a mandible, the growth occurs partly by endochondral ossification and partly by intramembranous ossification. The entire body of the mandible and ramus will grow by intramembranous ossification whereas a portion of the condylar region will grow by endochondral ossification later by resorption and deposition of the bone by the process of remodeling. In the mandible, the height of the mandible is increased by formation of bone in the region of the condyle and the mandible will be displaced in a downward and forward direction. The chin does not have its own growth potential, rather it is displaced in response to the growth in the condylar region. The ramus undergo growth by resorption on the anterior border and deposition on the posterior border of the ramus. Okay. This is how the length of the body will be increased, whereas the height is increased by uh, formation of bone in the region of condyle. Now, how can we study growth of an individual? There are different methods of studying the growth. One is measurement approach, another one is experimental approach. Measurement approach includes measurement of the uh, growth process directly on the skull or uh, living beings. This includes craniometry, anthropometry, cephalometry. Whereas the experimental approach uses several isotopes, dyes that can be injected into the uh, non-human living things, uh, in, sorry, uh, non-human uh, non uh, living beings to study the growth. Okay. Other methods of studying the growth are by utilizing naturally occurring markers within the skeletal tissues like trabeculae, neutrin canals, nerve canals, uh, canals through which the vasculature runs. So these are different natural markers based upon which we can study the growth of an individual. And one more method is by comparative studies. For example, if you take a human being, usually the processes which are being carried out in human beings are similar to those seen in some guinea pigs and rats. That's why uh, the researchers will conduct studies on guinea pigs and uh, uh, rats and they will relate it to the human beings because there are some similarities between the growth of tissues between these uh, organisms. Okay, So by comparative studies also we can assess the or we can study the growth of an individual. What is craniometry? It's nothing but measurement of the parameters on the skull remains of human beings. This is called as craniometry. And what is anthropometry? It is nothing but measurement of uh, parameters directly on the living being to study the growth of an individual. Now, we have a radiographic methods of growth by means of cephalometric radiograph. By using cephalometric radiographs, we can identify different landmarks in the craniofacial skeleton of the individual and by taking these uh, lateral cephalograms over different periods of time, we can assess the growth pattern, growth amount that is happening in an individual. One more method of studying the growth is vital staining. It was introduced by Belshire in 1936. Here what we do is will be injecting dye into the organism. This dye will be absorbed into the tissues of the organism and based upon the staining of the tissues by these dyes, we can assess the growth of an individual. Usually we will be using either alizarin red or acid alizarin blue or trypanin blue, uh, trypon blue, tetracycline or lead acetate. These are different dyes that can be used to study the growth of organism. But this is a uh, more uh, invasive procedure. It can't be done on human beings. It can be done only on uh, non-human organisms. 
with the con with the prior consent from animal organizations one more method of studying the growth is by injecting radio isotopes into the body of an individual not an individual it this is also an invasive method this can be done only in non human organisms okay here the dyes usually used are technetium 33 calcium 45 potassium 32 these are the natural uh, these are the dyes that are sorry these are the radioactive isotopes that are used to study the growth of organisms one more method of studying the growth of an individual or an organism is by using implants these are the inert materials made up of tantalum that can be inserted into different craniofacial structures of the growth of which we are uh, planning to study and based upon the serial radiographs that we take of these skeletal structures and based upon the displacement pattern and the displacement amount of these uh, implants that are impl that are that are inserted in the craniofacial skeleton we can assess the growth of an individual now what are the methods of collecting the growth data and what are the different types of studies that are available to study the growth usually the study can be classified into longitudinal cross sectional and semi longitudinal studies longitudinal studies are nothing but a group of individuals or a sample we call it as will be studied over a prolonged period of time at different intervals whereas the cross sectional studies are nothing but will be having two group or multiple groups of individuals which will be studied over a prolonged period of time and comparisons will be made within within these groups the longitudinal studies are expensive time taking and one more problem is as the study duration is a prolonged one there are chances of dropping off of the samples whereas cross sectional studies are of relatively short span easy to conduct and uh, there are no problems of dropping off of the sample or reduction in the sample size now one more type of study that can be carried out is semi longitudinal study it includes the uh, advantages of both longitudinal studies as well as cross sectional studies okay so these are the basic concepts of growth and development the pattern of the growth the variability of the growth different concepts describing the variability pattern of the growth and a uh, few things about growth spurts and the relation to the clinical practice everything has been discussed in this lecture thank you